everybody, it's Rob Seaver, Executive Director with Leeds Council. Uh, once again, super excited to bring you this week's webinar in our leadership series. This one is called Criv Critical Pivots in the Face of a Crisis, and I have a 100% rate of not being able to read uh, accurately, but I'm super excited to invite the people who have joined us today as panelists and moderator. Today's moderator is going to be Jonathan Pogat from DRIPS. Before we hand it over to him, though, I want to do a little bit of housekeeping. We have in your control panel, there should be either a questions and or a chat. If you have questions along the way, the panelists have agreed to go ahead and answer your questions as they can. If they don't get to it, we will try to answer those questions shortly after the webinar. Once again, we are recording this, and so as soon as it's over, fingers crossed, as long as things go well, I'll go ahead and edit it down and get it out as soon as possible. My run rate's been Sunday-ish, and so I'll get it out. Um, right now, Jonathan Pogat from DRIPS, I'm super excited you're gonna take over the heavy duty for me today as moderator. Um, welcome and thank you, it's your show. Thanks Rob, I appreciate it. I'm Jonathan Pogat, VP of Marketing at DRIPS and today I'm joined by three rock stars uh, to discuss the critical pivots uh, in the face of crisis. I think we, we've all been especially challenged uh, more than ever uh, in our careers, in our businesses, uh, it's a bit of an ominous title, but but necessary given where we are today as we strive to serve and continue to communicate with our customers. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, I've got Sean Nelson, Director of Marketing at Three Day Blinds, uh, Nicole Dalal, Executive SVP, Gaines Co. Auto Insurance, and Neil Kent, Director of Client Consulting Services at Contact Center Compliance. Hello, hello. Nicole, I hope I got your last name right. <laughs> Good enough. <laughs> right. But I always tell people uh, about mine. If it's close, I'm okay. But uh, let's let's get this kicked off. Uh, I'd love to. I'd love for you to tell us, uh, the audience, a little bit about your business, um, how you're engaging with your customers today, your prospects today. And um, Rob has allowed me one drips plug. And uh, if you could tell a little bit about how you're engaging with those customers with drips, we'll start with you, Sean. Sure. So, uh, yeah, hi, I'm Sean Nelson. I am the Director of Marketing for 3-Day Blinds, as Jonathan said. 3-Day um, Blinds is a shop at home company. So we send out design consultants to people's homes where we do the measurements. Um, we help the customer find the best options for their homes and then hopefully sell the products, have it installed and really offer a full turnkey system. The big problem here is that in-home part of it. Uh, we are not an online company right now. We do not have, uh, you know, e-tail. We don't really have stores, so we can't even kind of sneak into that um, Home Depot type scenario right now, or if you ever drive by a Home Depot, you're gonna see a line out the door. Uh, so we've really actually had to shut down for the last almost six weeks now, and are just now starting to open up again. And, uh, you know, to plug drips, we've actually been using drips to reach out to all of the customers who have reached out to us during our stay at home order and try and re-engage them, let them know that we're opening up in their area. And it's been very convenient for us because every area is opening up differently. I can't just send a list of all, you know, thousands and thousands of customers that reach out to us. I have to break it up by here's Dallas, here's Austin, here's every metro area that's opening up and make sure that we have a unique script for their needs. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an exciting time. Had we just had this call last week, there would be no talks about opening up, but right now we're, um, we're gonna be able to start running appointments again in certain states. All right, I'm Nicole DeLal, Senior Executive of Operations, which includes uh, two big call centers and our direct sales. Um, it was a pretty uh, crazy time for us um, here in Dallas to go from never working at home to working at home and getting all of our call center team into a work from home environment. We got it done in a little less than a week and it was extremely strenuous and stressful. And, um, you know, it wasn't something that we were prepared for at all. Um, we actually leveraged drips on a couple of different things um, because things happen very quickly here in the, in the Metroplex. 
we had to get a hold of all of our um, employees. So Drips was there to help us send out text messages to let let the employees know what was going on. Um, considering no one worked from home, no one really had, not everyone had email set up, so we couldn't have just sent a blast email. So we had to leverage a different means to talk to our, our teams. And then um, also Drips helps us with um, things like cancellations and pending cancellations. And it was a way for us to communicate even more strategically strategically with our customers about what was going on and and making sure you know they knew where we stood on specific things so it's a it's been an extremely exciting times um, we've gotten fairly settled into a lot of the work from home and as Sean alluded to it's now where Dallas is opening up tomorrow so we're thinking about how do we get people back and and be really conscientious and empathetic about you know getting people back in different situations so yeah, it's been a been a, a journey for sure. Hey everyone, I'm Neil Kent. I'm the senior consultant for Contact Center Compliance. Uh, we're on the marketing compliance, specifically TCPA. Or um, tell you can see I'm losing my voice because I talk all the time. Um, with with us transitioning um, into a work from home environment wasn't as difficult. Uh, what we really do is work with various clients to make sure that in their transition that they're still staying compliant in do not call and proper text messaging uh, and working with with uh, Jonathan and Drips, making sure that in a very heavily regulated environment, an aggressively regulated environment, that people who are messaging their customers and prospects aren't sort of running afoul. And we're seeing a dramatic increase in those problems, even in the middle of this sort of COVID thing. I think for me, the difficulty is that many times if I'm working with clients, I'm actually going to your office or going to the call center or, or, or visiting for an on-site and that we sort of have to do in a virtual. And then the other side of it is making sure that as you all pivot into a new environment, the regulators sort of expect you to sort of recenter where you are in compliance um, and generally as everybody's out rushing for new business the last thing that really kind of happens is uh, we're trying to convert sales we kind of forget that compliance and it sort of all of a sudden comes up and it's could be problematic great nicole i can't imagine moving a your call center completely remote in a week that's uh, an amazing accomplishment but yes. um yeah, i think we've all been faced with with changes, right? Uh, some changes um, for, I've found myself to be positive over the long term. Um, some of them obviously negative, right? Sean, you can't operate effectively. I'd love to hear from you. Like, what, are, what have been some of the positive things that have come out of this that you think will be good for the long haul? And, and what are the things that just you can't do much about? Sure. I would say, you know, addressing the the elephant in the room as we're all on Zoom right here, the the concept of working from home and what we could do to help uh, alleviate congestion, to help to look for a long term plan and how we get all of our employees back. I, I think working from home is going to be something that's going to be more part of our of our day to day life. Uh, which, if we think about it, for us specifically, we're based in California. It's a very expensive place to hire, let's say, call center agents. Uh, but if we can really get into a comfortable spot where we have a distributed workforce over, you know, over work from home offices, that could really, really change who we can hire and where they can live and what type of hours we can operate, especially for our call center. Um, as for marketing, you know, when you, when you shut down the entire company, it's really hard to screw things up after that, right? Like, so we needed to launch a new website. Great, let's go as fast as we can. Let's get it. Let's get it launched while everything is shut down. Because you know what? Even if it completely fails, we didn't hurt revenue. Um, there's those types of elements. Also, taking an opportunity to sit back and look at some of our business processes as a whole, like how how we offer products to our customers. Can we have a virtual consultation? Can we find a way to make it as safe as possible but still be in business? And those types of things we would just never consider if you understand, like having a salesperson in someone's home has a really, really positive effect on that close rate, right? You can build rapport in person that it's hard to do over the phone or over Zoom. So we just would not have considered it before. But now we can almost build more rapport over Zoom. We can be understanding that, that people are legitimately scared of what's going on out there, but still want to live their life to the best of their ability. So how do we fit their needs? 
And how do we fit the moral obligations that we as a company have across many different elements, right? You have the moral obligation to stay safe as a company, to keep Americans and the world safe from, from a very deadly disease. You also have the moral obligation to uh, make the products that we already sold, right? When we shut down, we couldn't even install products that were already purchased. So we really have a very strong obligation to our customers that already purchased from us to get in their home and get their products installed and solve their problems um, as they've come up. And then, you know, another one is we have to make sure that we keep people employed. We have all of our employees right here. You know, if we look at the Dow, if we look at some of the economic indicators, there's no reason to believe that the economy had completely collapsed, right? There is hope that things could turn around. I hope so. And if we don't keep our people employed and if we don't do our best to try and generate revenue again, then all we're going to do is contribute to this overall economic problem, which is serious as well. So trying to uh, address all of these different needs at once is, is quite a challenge and a challenge that you have to do over the phone with a limited workforce uh, and as quick as you could possibly do and quicker than you would ever have done anything before as a business. So silver lining, we've learned how to move quicker. Uh, we've learned how to be a little bit more nimble. We've learned how to be at home and we've pushed things faster because the risk of failure is a bit less right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you uh, on, on that, Sean. I think on, on our side, we've, um, we've, we've had a, a number of things that we could always been working on, right? And, and this has uh, allowed us to really reprioritize uh, what we focus on and how we do it. Um, I also agree about the Zoom thing. We've always been a Zoom organization, um, but um, prior to this, we, we didn't really have uh, our cameras up all the time, right? We, we didn't have the right setup might have been too dark in our room. I didn't have these professional lights around me like I do now. You know, I think the both the the productivity in our lives uh, and the, the efficiencies uh, at work have have been a huge change for me. And um, you know, it's one of the big takeaways is uh, you're capable of of a lot more now. Nicole, I'd love to to hear from you as well. Yeah, absolutely. First, I got to figure out about those lights that you've got. I'm sequestered to an upstairs room, <laughs> um, which is crazy, which is different, right? I mean, there's been so many things to learn, you know, through this process. I'm going to actually start with something that we really struggle with. Forget getting people to in their houses set up and ready to go. And we couldn't buy monitors. We couldn't buy laptops. I mean, everything was just like toilet paper. You just couldn't get things. And so we were leveraging so much stuff that the employee had. And, and I mean, just the camaraderie and everything where everyone was just together trying to get to this. Everyone wanted to do what was right by the policyholder and by the agents. But our big, big struggle was how do we get our leaders who have never worked from home to be able to lead? And we actually leverage Teams more than we leverage Zoom. And Teams has always been a uber collaborative place for us and in just like files and sharing and things like that. And my call center had never used anything like that. So our tech team was able to get everybody up and running. And, you know, we were able to pivot pretty quickly and just adjust like the call center timing. And that was big for us. We, 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 we span from Utah to Florida. Um, so we have different time zones, but we were able to just see the volume of calls change. So we were able to get to a, a more condensed time um, from being open. So that way we could have all of our call center people in one place open. And then we could take them offline. We could take them offline because you have so much more people in a condensed amount of time. We could take them offline and have conversations, do Zoom chats and and you know or Teams chats and talk with them. So that way, you know, they knew it was going on because um, as soon as we got settled, regulations changed, and so we had to make sure that the the CSRs and the, the people that are helping our policyholders and agents were able to adjust. They needed to know what to do, and it's hard to communicate an email. You're getting hundreds of emails, so the ability to have conversations and, and like you said be um, you know face to face if you will was really helpful and I think that this has definitely changed the way we're going to do business uh, to Sean's point like seeing that we have some call center people who are highly productive at home way more than they were in the office is very telling and um, we're already working on you know getting a work from home policy established because there are some people who really excel in that and and uh, that was really cool and the leader you know they're they're still getting through it. it it's still difficult when you're you're not used to walking around your call center but you know I think there's there's room for for us to live in kind of this hybrid world which I'm, I'm pretty excited about actually 
I say one big learning for us was, or at least even just for me personally, is how to manage. The, I've had to learn how to manage my team remotely and and manage people that I've never had to manage before. Generally, the the staff reporting up to me has been you know all salaried high. Like I, I have managers in between. Well, during this time, all of my managers for the call center had to be furloughed because we had no revenue. So I actually had to learn how to manage my appointment service team from scratch for uh, for the team that we had, and um, you know. That's not a small. That's not a small skill. I, I I do feel for your 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 individuals you had to train. The other thing that we've had a kind of a blessing is you mentioned Teams. So we just started testing Ring Central right before all this happened, and that for us the communications platform, whether you use Teams or Ring Central or some other one that I'm not thinking of right now, what a godsend. Those technologies have gone so much further than I last time I looked at them, and it's it's truly been a godsend for us to have one clean communications platform that the whole company is sharing. And that's something that's relatively new because even for us, we had several departments using each their own communications tool. And to have the company all unify and say, hey, during this time, we all need to be on the same thing. What a win. It's it's been a it's been a godsend. I don't I don't know about you guys. Um, how did you all find sort of this transition? You know, I'm I'm clearly not in my own office. Uh, I'm a pacer when I get on the phone and I'm actually borrowing my wife's office. So we have our own little WeWork thing going on in the house. We've got two Fortune 100 companies on conference calls. You got me. And then the Baffet Hound kind of likes to make the round. And so now it's where you would normally have your files and spread out. You're trying to concentrate and, and work on your environment. You're in a, in a short amount of time in a wholly new environment and then trying to kind of keep that under control. and the occasional dog barking in the middle of a conference call. Yeah, and throw in homeschool. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it's been, I, I think everyone had to just have grace about it. You know, we had to realize that we had call center reps who are in the same position as me. I've got a school age kid, so I, a daughter, so I had to work around my schedule. So we were just very, very flexible with people and trying to work with them and, and think through, you know, um, what it is. And, and, and call centers, yes, yeah, very sensitive. And you've got a lot of call center reps in an apartment, right? And they're in an apartment with maybe roommates or their dogs or whatever it may be. And, you know, I, I think I think everybody in in the world has just given everybody grace. And, you know, when the dog's barking and we can hear it on a recorded call and the agent's like, oh, you know, it's okay. You know, they're they're in the same position as us, but it's it's been different. It, it's definitely been a eye-opening experience that, you know, things are possible, but, you know, and just the empathy that we can give and, and just the the flexibility, the flexible working arrangement, you know, forget just work from home, but just being flexible to what their needs are and, and whatnot. And um, luckily most of them were tied to a phone anyway, so walking around wasn't a thing. <laughs> but for us in the, in the more professional sense, like I'm also running a large project, we've got huge transformational projects going on and having like teams to talk through and these kind of things, but we were always collaborating. I mean, 40 piece people meetings, that was weird. That was was weird to get to in a space where we're having you know more like micro meetings and and trying to get things answered quickly to get this get projects up and running yeah it's it's been it's been fun but stressful for sure i will say one one big learning for me specifically was a today is thursday i, I learned that because i've forgotten days of weeks and then B, on Thursdays, apparently the trash truck comes, the neighbor's gardener comes, we still get mail delivered, and my dog is experiencing complete and utter hell and likes to let everyone know. So that's been an experience. Um, the other thing I've really learned, too, is to be really clear with my team that even though I might be working really late hours or sending emails at odd times because it's convenient for me, that I do not expect them to respond to really have a set of work hours and let your team decompress. Because I know vice versa, I, I got sick from the stress. When we had to do all this shutting down, I, I'm not gonna claim I handled it really well. It was one of the most stressful things I've ever gone through. I had to think about what employees we could keep, what employees were being lost, how to service all their customers that were you know, ultimately being wronged here. And it's not even our fault, but it's still our, in our hands. Uh, all of that, and then with endless hours, you're just going to get sick. So so making it really clear with my team of, hey, here's my expectations. If I really need you, I'm going to be very, very clear. Like I'm going to call you and text you. But if I'm not doing that, I don't really need you. 
and that it's okay if you're not at your phone 24 7 etc like really help push your culture down otherwise people are just going to follow you and get really stressed out and that might not be your intent yeah that was a great question neil i think a lot of this comes down to uh, in my opinion uh, empathy and trust right trust for your team uh, being empathetic knowing that we're all in this together right i've got uh, a three-year-old boy he's about to be three an eight-year-old boy i've got a 14 year old stepdaughter she's mostly on on tiktok so she doesn't doesn't make too much noise but she helps out a bit and sometimes she can't and um you know sometimes i have a little three-year-old crawling on my lap during a morning huddle uh, or during a meeting and you know there's just not much you can do about it but um it's it's gonna happen to everybody and and it's not a big deal either, I think, right? Like pop him on the camera, have him look at everybody, say hi, and then he goes on his way. So um, we're all, we all have our own unique challenges. And uh, if you've got you know, a lot of empathy for the situation that we're in, you trust your team, you trust your employees that work with you, um, this isn't so hard anymore. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So out of, out of curiosity, we talked a little bit about Zoom, but have there been any other tools that you've had to, to leverage um, on your side when it comes to uh, sales trainings, um, uh, coaching, or uh, specifically managing your team or across collaboration? Yeah, I know for us, um, in, especially in a call center environment, everyone's so close to each other, you know, the manager can, you know, stand up and be like, oh, I hear that word, you, you shouldn't be using it, and they can run over and try to stop something. So we we have the Genesis phone system, so we've always um, handled like live audits and auditing soft, all the stuff that comes out of the amazing Genesis software. So um, it was the, especially for the sales, uh, direct sales team, they leverage their leadership, they leverage the live audit a lot and then they were on teams communicating you know helping them manage through things um, same with both call centers even the operational call center live audit when you're a remote was super powerful it's not something they normally would have done because they again they could hear what was going on inside the call center but being remote they've they've just become you know really used to using that live audit functionality and you can communicate in so many different ways inside that that live audit as far as training we're actually rolling out a new uh, policy system in about 30 days um, so we have been using a lot of video we'll record ourselves you know doing the video of going through the policy system and and sharing that and that has worked a lot and it's actually going to be interesting because we also have to do that for our agent force because we're rolling out a, a new user interface as well and so the video capability of recording ourselves doing things has helped with the trainings for either you know agents internal or external and um the uh just the, the the way to communicate video and like you said if you can make them click like TikTok, you can get your whole call center to watch everything very quickly and, and made it you know make it fun so we've leveraged a lot of video a lot of uh live auditing um those those have been huge for us over the, the past time it's um it's interesting uh, you know obviously in tcpa anybody that, uh, excuse me, anybody that any call centers or any companies that are involved in telemarketing, you're required to have your agents and supervisors uh, take a TCPA or have documented evidence of training. Uh, we've always had uh, that online module that's both question and answer and video, as, as Nicole said. And we, I've seen an interesting trend that we see an uptick of users coming in to refresh everybody on sort of the, the rules of, of the road. Uh, you know, in this this kind of environment. So while you're getting them at, at home and they're going on to these processes, it's just a reminder of, uh, of you know, it's certainly from the TCPA side, you know, what those trainings are. And the interesting thing that I think I'm seeing with agents, and I don't know if you see this, Nicole, well, now that they're dealing with calls at home, I think that more and more folks are becoming um, very aware of the spammy calls and suddenly realizing, hey, I don't like those interruptions and therefore I wanna make sure I'm not considered one of those spammy guys, what am I supposed to know? Am I making that call too early? You know, is, is there something going on in this process that I need to know about? 
Yeah, I agree with that. I think they're definitely more self-aware. Um, and I think just in the situation, they're more empathetic. You know, they, they, we follow a lot of the rules already, but uh, they've, they've toned it down just, you know, just based on empathy. And, um, but you're right. They, they are getting, they're getting a lot more calls too, as well, being home and, you know, and then, you know, maybe their spouse or partner is home and they're getting the calls and, you know, I think they've all, they've, they've become more conscientious without, you know, the boss telling them what to do. They've, they felt it as you, as you have said, Neil. So, yeah. Hey, John, I'm going to throw a question to you, certainly within, in, in, in working with clients going through drips, you know, certainly in the SMS environment, we've seen a lot of spammy stuff that you're seeing, you know, within your clients and you guys are really just brilliant at, at, at helping that communications stay effective and compliant. And to me, compliant means a better communication. But do you see sort of that same sort of thing where people are now going, hey, I'm thinking twice before I initiate a campaign. And then as it comes through into that flow to have sort of a better connectivity and better messaging and better conversions and better intelligence. Yeah, I think the the lesson for for our clients and all marketers really is um, is that empathy key that piece, right? It's uh, being very aware of the situation that we're all in today, um, because the messaging really matters. Um, I think we've at first when we started to hear back from brands, regardless of the channel, right, email or uh, a text message or phone, it was uh, we're here for you, we care, and, and that felt really good until day two where you heard that from 200 other marketers, right? Then, then it started to become a little bit inauthentic. So I think their key really is uh, uh, authenticity, right? Um, you know, there are some, uh, you know, some use cases and some, some tests that I've seen uh, around uh, using messaging around um, do this from the comfort of your home, right? But if you are always able to do that from the comfort of your home, how, how does that change what you could be doing today? So it's been, uh, been really ineffective uh, if it's not authentic as possible. So I think authenticity is key. Uh, consumers are still responding. They're paying attention. They're engaging. They're buying. As you can see in e-commerce, uh, it's exploding right now. Um, by the way, good luck finding anything fitness related. I know this is not about that, but if you've tried to buy a kettlebell, a dumbbell, a rower like I have, um, there's a whole black market out there for that kind of stuff right now. So people are spending money. Uh, they're engaging with brands. They're engaging with offers. Uh, but you've got to be super authentic about it. And um, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Uh, it just as kind of a, a general principle, right? We're all at home. It doesn't mean that you should be upping your cadence uh, or pressuring your, uh, your prospects, your customers more or inundating them with messaging from email and phone calls and text messages. I think you've really got to uh, approach uh, your communications with uh, as much care as possible these days. Say so one thing that we've had to pay a lot of attention to was making sure that we have unified communications more so now than ever. Right now, marketing can get a message out, but marketing is right now because most of our uh, clients that we're reaching out to are people that have already shown strong interest in our brand and we're just trying to do right by by prioritizing them that we're just reminding them hey we're back hey you asked us to reach out to you before we're reaching out now and and facilitating that the rest is going to be our sales department and making sure that we come up with a really good uh, clean message coming from sales which normally it wouldn't to help build that rapport because that personal connection our sales people are going through the exact same things as our clients that's the perfect way for us to understand, you know, to, to, to communicate in a way that's genuine. Um, so we have to work with more people on communication than we would otherwise had to work with before, which has been a really interesting path. Um, as for tools that have helped us, uh, I, I mentioned Ring Central, uh, that's been a godsend. Um, but we also work closely with Invoca and they do a lot of call monitoring for us and a lot of um, AI type knowledge nuggets for us. And as especially as we have a, a uh, dispersed call center, having software that listens to all the calls and calls out those words that aren't supposed to be said, or the the nuances of conversation that are really kind of off script are are important for us. It, it will point out to us problems before, you know, someone's listening to calls that we don't want to listen to. <laughs> I actually see a question uh, for me. So. There was a question about, um, do, I, do we think Gainsco will move, be more open to remote work going forward, or are we just going to rush right back into in-house staffing? 
Um, I think it's a combination. We are currently working through what our get back to the office motif is going to be. Um, again, we have staff who have uh, kiddos at home and they still need to be there to homeschool. So I think our goal right now is we're going to slowly roll back in. We are not going, we're typically early adopters to a lot of things. We are not going to be an early adopter to getting back to the office. We've proven that, you know, over the last four weeks that um, we can still stay productive. And so we're going to um, slowly work our group back in. And we are, like I said earlier, we're going to we're going to build or we're currently working on a work from home policy to see if we can't work in that world and that hybrid world. So we're going to give some some uh, some people are still in the office. I do want to say that we have a lot of mail mailroom people and uh, check processing people who are have been in the office because it's very hard to bring home a 500 ton mail machine. So there are some people still in the office. Office. But, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people want to see each other. We have a lot of people on the project who want to get back to the office. So we're going to have a, a slow rollout um, through the month of May. Um, to get some people back, and I think uh, I think we're also gonna. Go, I, I'm I'm personally gonna keep the work from home for for the high producers, maybe as a little carrot, uh, to see if we can't keep that high productivity up. And if that's the environment they excel in, then I think it's something that as a company we have to recognize. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I know on our side, uh, we definitely don't want to be first when it comes to going back to the office, right? Um, it's it's definitely something that'll come in the future. We have kids that can't go back to school, and um, you know, doing doing what's right for uh, our, our employees is definitely top of mind. Say so us being based in California, we, I mean, obviously other states are opening up before California is, so we can't go back to the office, even if huge parts of our company are opening up. So work from home is going to be a very important part of our uh, organization for the foreseeable future. Really makes me wonder how um, office, like offices and companies are going to do real estate. I mean, my goodness, not too long ago, we were really thinking about expanding the size of our office. And what does that mean? You know, I, maybe we still will, maybe we won't, but I, I can't imagine we're the only ones thinking about, do we need as much office space as we currently have? Could be a huge, yes. huge cost savings. I agree. We literally had that conversation as an executive team yesterday. <laughs> we were thinking because we are growing so rapidly as a company and, and we've already, you know, are, have like four four floors in the building and we were thinking about the fifth and now we're like, well, maybe we don't need to do that to save some money. So I'm with you, Sean. You guys uh, hate to be the Debbie Downer here, but of course, it's always about compliance. So now you, everybody here, and I'm sure a lot of the listeners have taken their employees, they work from home and you're talking about, hey, you know, maybe I don't need this big office, but now I have all these employees at home. How do you factor in any potential added liabilities? Because now when they're on your property, they're on your insurance, but now they're in their home doing business on your behalf. You know, all these different things that, that probably enter into a whole new sort of matrix of, of stuff that you have to deal with, let alone trying to figure out how to now run team building sort of thing. How does that work for, for all of you guys? Can I give can I give my short answer? I'm in marketing and that's an HR problem. <laughs> Same. Well, I mean, we, have, we have thought about it, we have discussed it, and it is a big concern, and we do have a lot of forums and so on, but ultimately can't there's certain things that we make decisions and factor in, and there's certain things that we factor our decisions on. And this one is something that we've made our decision and then factored it in. We understand that there's a liability and it sucks, and it's a thing that we have to think about and be aware of and make sure that we can make the working environment as safe as possible for our employees, but we gotta do what we gotta do, right? It, it's, we just have to. Yeah, well, as an old HR person, <laughs> Uh, you know, the big thing when you're building these policies, obviously you're right, Neil, you've got to think about those uh, workers comp is a big one. When you're doing work from home, you've got to, um, you know, you've got to make sure that they've got a compliance and accessible workplace. Um, there's, so I've done work from home policies in the past. There's lots of ways of doing it. I mean, you can take pictures and, and they can send pictures in and you can sign off on that to say you agree. You know what? It's what is interesting for us right now. Our big struggle is equipment. Is is more on like, do we supply the equipment? Do we supply the chair? Do we supply that? Do we give an allowance and have the 
the employee, you know, handle that? Those have been the big questions for us because a lot of people are working from, you know, their their 11 inch laptop right now and and doing okay. But in a perfect world, they'd have a dual monitor set up and and be able to rock like they can in the office. And um, yeah, we are we are definitely adding uh, work uh, a lot of different compliance type pieces to our policy um, to make sure that, uh, to Sean's point, the employee is safe, um, they're in a safe working environment, um, but also to, to cover us, of course. <laughs> I, I would imagine, a, a, sorry, John, I was going to say, I would imagine for the, the new environments, even stuff like, you know, if you're in an environment where you take a credit card, it was easy to control credit card acceptance, you know, when you're in a centralized office, but now you've got employees taking credit cards at home and you've got customers trying to feel, and they understand that somebody's taking a credit card at home and how to not make that a disconnect, let alone a liability. So a marketing issue for you, Sean, a compliance issue for Nicole and some of the other folks, you know, well, to, I, to go I can, through. Yeah, I can say for us, those types of jobs in which there's, you know, real risk at customer data, or, or money changing hands, those ones we've actually marked as, as essential to be in the office. So there's just certain types of jobs that unfortunately we're, ju we're just not gonna send home. If you need, like for instance, if we're taking in checks, right? Like you're not gonna send that to someone's home. You, you have to send that to an office. Um, so there's always gonna be some sort of hybrid, I, I imagine. So I've heard the C us, word come up. Oh, go ahead, Nicole, please. Sorry, just real quick, just to address the credit card. So we've obviously always taken credit card in the office over the phone. People pay their policy premium and whatnot. And uh, we have a phone system built for that. So they, we have the secure pause, we have that. The reality of it is they could write it down on a piece of paper in the office or they could write it down on a piece of paper at home. And, and you know, you just, we have a really close relationship with our payment processor. We have alerts everywhere if anything happens, if, you know, there's, there's there's, there's tran multiple transactions. A lot of that we were set up for, but you're right. It, it is probably, I've never thought about it. It's probably weird for a, a consumer, or maybe it's not. Everyone gives everyone thing away now, but maybe it's, you know, maybe it is weird for an agent to give a credit card to someone who they believe is at, is at home. But um, yeah, for us, we've, we've always secured that process and, and just carried that through into the, the work from home environment. So. Great. Speaking of compliance, um... I think it's been brought up a few times already on this call, understanding how much disruption this has made at the call centers and with dialing consumers reaching out to your current customers. How difficult has it been to maintain compliance in your business, uh, specifically TCPA? I can start because mine is pretty easy. Because we are more or less shut down, compliance has been pretty simple. Um, we, we don't do a lot of outbound calling. And when we do, we, we still have compliance measures in place. We make sure that we cover all of the language. And even for the customers who have reached out to us and asked us to call them back, we are still making sure that we have TCPA compliance on those calls. And if we don't, if we don't have a clear record of that customer specifically giving us permission, then we're gonna manually call them. It's just time consuming. But it's also one of those opportunities where, hey, as we were shut down and we were really, really slow, we can bring some employees back and pay them to do this. And you know what? That is better than not paying them for anything. We're, so, you know, pick your battles. In our case, we wanna do the best we can for our employees and our customers. And if that means it's gonna be slightly more expensive for us to say TCPA compliant, but also get more people some jobs right now. All right, I'll take that as two wins, not necessarily a punishment. And I think for us, you know, our the, the inbound call center is obvious. I mean, they're getting calls in. That that's not a problem. It's it's the sales reps who, you know, they're paid on a commission. And so when the volume was dropping significantly in the beginning of April, you know, we had to be super conscientious and on them about not making calls after hours, or you know, making sure there weren't, you know, sending their own texts or sending, you know, whatever it was. So we, we just set up some gates in place so that way we could make sure that it was covered. It, it dialed, you know, to be honest, it, it after a while, it kind of dialed down. Everyone settled in, everyone got used to it, but we were very hyper-focused at that front end and the leadership, the sales leadership was like, you know, don't, don't do anything extra. I, we know you're losing sales, but just, just don't do it. At the end of the day, just don't do it. It's not worth it, you know? And, and, and to Neil's point earlier, like you don't want to, 
you don't want to get that call at 10 o'clock at night. Why would someone else want to get that call? And um, so we were just um, we were just super vigilant at the very beginning. And, and now it's just kind of like I said, it's just kind of settled, settled back in. But we had to we definitely had to keep our eyes on a lot of people. And Neil, this is your world. What are you seeing? <laughs> um, unfortunately, you know, I, I think I said sort of at the beginning of the session that, you know, as people transition, uh, the regulators do assume, you know, whether you're a major corporation, uh, that a change in your process mandates a reexamination of your marketing compliance policies, not just TCPA. And that's actually a, a, a good thing. But what I'm really seeing is that uh, as companies are going, they're, they're trying to, like Sean said, you know, if we open up, I want to keep people employed. So they're going out for business or getting more leads or doing all this sort of stuff. And, you know, with over 400 and I don't know, 60 odd TCPA lawsuits filed since the beginning of the year, um, the, the regulators have more time at home and they're looking for you and the serial litigators, the people that just do this kind of, you know, bother you for, for a, uh, for a living, they're jumping all over uh, and nobody's really getting a gimme. So I'm seeing more and more people suddenly go, you know, I'm going to text all my customers and let them know we're open. You didn't have the rights to do it. You know, where, where Sean just said, he said, you know, we we're sort of examining consent and sort of manually dialing or not doing an auto blast where we don't have the right to do it. And I'm just seeing more and more people uh, in this hurry up offense to, to stay alive, aren't paying attention to it. And unfortunately, TCPA, you know, under the current administration, you know, they rolled back business rules and regs in almost every area, but telemarketing, which includes texting, is actually increasing and it's tightening down and they're getting, they're, they're, they're trying to do more enforcement. And so in one case where I'm concerned about is you, you'll sort of see companies doing what they can to survive and we're going to get in more business. I want to keep my employees. And the next thing you know, you get this demand letter that has the potential to turn into a class action lawsuit. And it doesn't matter if you're a sports team. You've got fans that just sued a sports team, sports team lost. You've got, I, I posted, I think I said on, on this thing, a, a marijuana dispensary. Who's going to sue a marijuana dispensary? We're all sort of nervous. We need it. They got sued, and you don't have to be a major player. You can be a small entity in, you know, even the insurance, even in B two B in some of that great area, a gray area. You know, Texas. I think Nicole, you you guys are in Texas. Of course, Texas is a no call, wireless state. So if you don't have permission, you can't manually dial a number, a prospect in Texas or auto dial. So all these sort of things. But the bottom line that we've seen is the regulators have amped it up. And you don't have to, the court say, well, who's going to file a lawsuit? You can file that stuff electronically. So it is a problem. But I do think the other side of it, and just like Sean was sort of saying, hey, or Nicole, you said we're, we're sort of pausing and reexamining, that I think, you know, if you look at it from the perspective of who you're trying to call, if your overall message is we respect your data privacy and security and we respect your channel communications choices, that's a message everybody really likes. And instead of making compliance the thing you don't want to do, use it as a competitive advantage, right? Use it as an awareness. Use it as a sort of initial respect handshake connection to, to people or essentially communicate with people who you can in a way that they are okay with being communicated with. Well, one thing to, to that's that's a great point, Neil. Uh, the other thing I've learned as a marketing leader is to make sure you understand what's compliant and what's not compliant to your core. Because when you're CEO or when someone else says, "Hey, can we do this?" you don't want to be like, "Hey, let me think about it and get back to you." You want a hard no. If you can't do it because it's not compliant, don't do it. Don't try and figure out a way to do it. Just don't do it. So then you build up your plans as to what is compliant, and knowing what's compliant, what communication processes can we do? Right. So just set expectations up front. Otherwise, you, you get into those areas where they're like, hey, just do this really quick. And then you come back later. and You're like, oh, my God, not compliant. Just start with compliance first. And I think the, the other side of that, sorry to jump in on you, Nicole, the other side of noncompliance is not just a, a monetary issue, is your impact to your brand. You know, in social media, people go, these people are spamming me. You know, that I think has a greater deleterious effect than the fact that you can be brought into court and you're going to have, a, you know, some sort of, of, of penalty. Now, don't get me wrong. 
I always focus on TCPA because it's one of the few areas of compliance that you have personal liability. Everybody goes, oh, no, my company. Well, a lot of times your insurance won't cover you. And you can be sued individually without any sort of, a, of escape or protection from your corporation. So you are sort of encouraged, uh, you know, within this sort of environment. But I always see it as, as a brand impact. Oh, those guys are spammers. Well, that's going to make your sales guys, that's a harder challenge. Why do you want to put a, a, a drag shoot on the sales environment? And creating an environment, you know, we, we, we all pay attention to really bad, you know, we try to create an environment of, uh, so we don't do bad workplace things, right? We all accept that. So navigating under the rules of the road and using it to your advantage, I think, is probably a, a, a good thing or can be a good thing, you know, going forward. And certainly for the rest of the year, the, the nobody, you know, as far as the regulators and the litigators, they're not backing off. They're going out for business, too, and they can make a lot of money doing this thing. Great. I want to encourage everybody listening and watching um, to submit your questions uh, into the chat. Um, we'll have a few minutes at the end of this to answer those. Um, but in the meantime, I do have a good question going back uh, from, uh, to work from home. This is for everybody. Do you worry that this period of work from home is kind of like January 5th after New Year's Eve in the gym? <laughs> Feels like a honeymoon phase to me. I think that's a, a great question. Yeah, I, I think for our group, there is so much of, yeah, when is this going to end? Because it's so good right now. And this is this is a honeymoon phase, I think, for a lot of a lot of people, a lot of the ways that they are looking at it. I am I'm worried about how the transition is going to be. I, I really do. I don't know how the call center team is going to take it when they they leave their honeymoon and reality sits sits in. Um, but I think we're that's why we're going to really stage it and we're going to really there there are people regardless in the call center and on especially on the sales team they want to see people they want to come back to the office and they want to be with their peers and in in a different sense of norm because you know the call center is structured by its timing like that's that's obvious but I also have a professional staff who is to I think Sean said earlier is like everybody is working all the time and it's hard to get away and and, and the office is a bit of a getaway so I think that, it, that again some people are going to are ready to come back to work they have told me they're ready to come back and some people have kind of fell into this space that actually really works for them so we're just we're going to be just super conscientious about how we how we move people back into the office and and who actually stays home i'd say playing off of nicole same kind of concept there are certain um, agents employees that we have that don't have great internet connection don't have a great place at home to actually do work um, and who have been more or less furloughed because they just can't work from home. So those types of people we absolutely want to bring back, that the office is their sanctuary. Uh, sanctuary. For me personally, I was over it like day two. I love my family dearly. I love my pets. Uh, you know, great mailman. The gardeners are awesome. I would love to be away from them too. Uh, I have two college age kids that are doing Zoom meetings and trying to do classes. I have two elementary school kids that are doing Zoom meetings and trying to do classes. I have a wife who has a job just like mine who is trying to do Zoom meetings and get her work done. And we don't have that big a house. So I'm smack dab in the middle of the kitchen hoping to God the rest of my family can be quiet so that I don't look like a total fool on this call. But uh, if I was given the option to go back to work, I'd be there. I'd be at the office in a heartbeat. I'm tired of buying my own coffee, guys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I'm, I can guarantee that my wife would like me back in the office. She's been kind enough to give me her office. She works from home or occasionally goes in the city. You know, my daughter is riding it out with us from Chicago is in her old bedroom in the room next door. My wife has taken over the, uh, the kitchen and you know, I, I can't wait. To, I'm not sure if the office wants me back, but I, I can't wait to get back. And it's, it's just hard to, to sort of navigate in, in this whole new in, environment. And I also like to see people. I'm obviously a talker and it's nice to sort of socialize uh, to what you can do. And I think in some cases that 
that human interaction does help productivity a little bit just to you get that sort of team spirit which is harder to you know i don't know how you guys do it as man as managers and you john is you say you have that morning huddle it's one thing when you're all sitting in the room i've read something it's kind of like the distract that they're calling it zoom distraction where they're sort of advising people don't put yourself on mute because what people are doing is they're putting themselves on mute and then they're going to their cell phones and doing something else you as a manager you know you're kind of looking when they're looking away usually me if i'm looking away i'm just petting the dog here but just trying to keep everybody focused is is really really tough and when we open up again we want to recover from everybody i'm sure on on this on this webinar and all the panelists you know you want to you want to continue that business flow and get back to whatever the new normal is going to be and one thing that's kind of helped us really quick was uh, at the end of the day, every day, we have a little bit of a wrap up call, a wrap up Zoom meeting with my entire marketing department that's still here. And it just kind of helps because it gives that little cap to the end of the day that after this, you're free. You know, you can kill, still work if you want to, but after this call, you're more or less, we're not expecting to get a hold of you right quick. And that's that's been nice for us. I might steal that idea from you, Sean. I like that. So are you doing uh, one huddle per day at the end of the day, or are you doing one in the morning? So we just do one huddle at the end of the day uh, and okay. on Zoom, on camera. Like, let's get everyone engaged for this one quick conversation. And it might be a really, it might be five minutes. It might be a whole hour, depending on what we need to go over and what business yeah. communications. And obviously, another thing, too, because we're not all in the office, there's a lot of communication happening outside of normal channels. And, you know, making sure that you can share the relevant share the relevant um information from your executives and have a path to do that is is very helpful because otherwise a lot of things just slip through the cracks like you you don't know who's heard what or who needs to know what and this just helps get everyone in the same room at the same time that's right i th think i echo everybody's sentiment um with the honeymoon phase um i i'm somebody that just loves the energy of an office especially one at a, a fast growing company like Drips is where uh, everybody works together uh, pretty closely, both physically and, and also just like figuratively. So uh, I do miss that quite a bit. I have seen, uh, I'm grateful actually that I've seen my kids more than I have um, just being here, right? Um, my commute's pretty long, um, but that's also part of my routine. So I do miss the routine. Uh, I do miss having some quiet time. Um, although I will say, and I'm a late adopter to this, these noise hands canceling headsets, I would recommend to anybody in this world, especially um, if you are trying to get work done at home and if you have uh, ambient noise around you, these things are amazing, I can't hear a thing. Um, so I would highly recommend getting yourself a good pair of uh, noise canceling headphones. Yeah, I think we'll get back. Um, I think it'll be different. I think everything will be a little bit different and um, I'm looking forward to it, just like everybody else is, I think. And one final. Um, oh, we do have a question. Let's let's try to get this question in. Sean and Nicole, my company operates in lead generation in the professional sports and live entertainment industries. We're working with teams and properties to adapt uh, going into the new normal. That said, is the live space and place where you see opportunity for your companies? Wow, that is, I, I'm going to try and answer this one quickly for our side. That is so to be determined. It all depends on what actually happens with the live events, right? When things are going to turn around, our sports, like what sports are going to be playing? Are they going to have live audiences? Are they going to have half live audiences? Or I mean, like half of the audience, not half dead. Uh, you know what? I, we don't know what they're going to do. So I would love to say, yes, it's important to us. It was important to us in the past, but now, uh, I don't know. Is it going to exist? You know, and if it does, at what, in what way? So I hope that was a completely vague answer that did not answer your question at all. But the big question, it's, we don't know. What it, what's the future got for us? Yeah, I'm with Sean too. I think the unknown is still there. I'm, I'm still holding out football season. We'll, we'll be there. So from there, well, I think we'll, we'll see the, yeah, it's always an opportunity, you know, of, of a place to market, but um, it's probably not at the top of my list based exactly what Sean said on the unknown. Just don't know what's going to happen with, with the, the entertainment space. It was uh, kind of interesting. I, um, 
didn't the NFL draft have one of the uh, largest viewerships yes. uh, ever, right? Yep. It, it was just massive on the ratings. So we are sort of starved for sports, even if it's going to be televised. And in the entertainment side, what I've seen, we we do know, you know, what, you know, I have to know just other things that, that we do, that a lot of the groups are trying to figure out when they can go back out on the road, what that means. Uh, and does virtual, you, you do see some acts now doing uh, sort of virtual sort of concerts and things. I think the technology is getting better and people are, are at the moment okay. You know, there's nothing like a big crowd when you're seeing a concert or, or a sporting event. But in this sort of virtual new world, you know, if that's going to be okay, I think the live tune-in event is there. And of course, there's always advertising, right? There's always that opportunity in a digital environment to go through, to go through there. And so I think there will, those those opportunities will be explored. Uh, hopefully, I know I'll you know it doesn't really affect us, but you know, hey, bring on the programming. I'll tune in. I'll buy something from you guys. Also, a great time to advertise in daytime television. Just saying. There you go. I think people are starved for entertainment. If there, if there are any UFC fans, uh, UFC 249 is happening May 9th to uh, a total of 10 people. Uh, I think they're they're going to be fighting in Florida. So I think people just want and need an escape in some way or another. How are right. they going to stay I, six feet apart? Uh, <laughs> no idea. I have no idea. Maybe animation. Little, uh, animation. Animation, maybe uh, hand signaling. I'm not sure. One last question. I know we want to wrap up here. Um, and this one's a bit open-ended. But uh, if you were to look into your crystal ball, what do you see? What does the future look like? Well, I'll that's go with- That's a tough one. Go I, ahead, Sean. I got to think. I, <laughs> I, I honestly see hope. You know, uh, I have a really good team at Three Day Blinds, very good leaders. Uh, and we have grown this company from very small to very big. And you know what? We know we've done it before, we can do it again. And I think that a lot of the elements that made our economy strong before are still there. It's just a matter of how quickly we can launch things up. We also have the slight benefit of, of our consumers being so incredibly empathetic to our situation because all of their companies and jobs are going through the same things. So we, you know, kind of going back to compliance and make sure we don't screw things up. Yes, we gotta be as compassionate understanding as we can, but we have this beautiful opportunity now where people are going to be compassionate with us. So we want to take advantage isn't the right word for it, but we, we want to accept that this is where we are, this is where we are right now and, and try and live in that environment and find the hope as opposed to the frustration. Because if all we focus on is how much business we've lost and everything that's gone awry, it's just going to be depressing, right? But if we focus on our opportunity and realize, hey, every goal that we had now gets to be rethought. Every growth path that we thought we were going to take now gets to be redefined and find the fun enjoying that then then we can actually kind of make this a, a better opportunity right like we get to rebuild our company as we want to so great let's take that opportunity let's set our goals let's beat records let's come up with what records should be and and have fun doing it otherwise it's just pure depression uh, for us, we were forced into a virtual world that we were not ready for. Um, this has definitely changed so many things and I think opened up a lot of the executive leadership into things that we always said we would never do. We were not, and never is a strong word, but we were like, we are not going to work from home. We are a highly collaborative, you know, company. We will always be in the office. And I know the CEO is now seeing that it's a possibility and, and, and it doesn't impact productivity because that's at the end of the day, what everybody worries about that working from home is going to negatively impact productivity and and we're proving that and we were forced into this situation and I, you know I, sometimes you know good things come out of chaos and and I think this is a good thing for us and and the virtualness of even how we interact with our independent agents has has come from this and um, we're going to embrace a lot of things we've already embraced them and proven that it can work and I'm actually really excited to see some some new things like 
flexible working arrangements and working from home and you know virtual trainings and and all these things that we are just doing on the fly and it's it's working and that's the crystal ball for us is how can we take the next half of the year and adapt to this new virtual world that I, I think that we can continue to excel in. I think, I think for us, you know, our focus is just as we will get through the other side of it, people are, are going to aggressively go and help and want to build their business. And for us, it's just helping them sort of stay on the proper side of compliance because that will turn out to be a lot of companies' Achilles heel. And like, as Sean and Nicole said, if you sort of organize around it, you can use it to your advantage. Uh, but if not, um, there are no gimmies in the space. And with triple digit increases in complaints and demands and lawsuits, um, that's one of the few areas, unfortunately, we just can't back off from. But we will we try to help you through it and just not get in the way of growth. In our side, um, one of our core values at Drips is uh, improve, and I can't think of a better core value for me personally to be focused on, our team to be focused on, than uh, making the most of what we can out of the situation that we're in. Uh, there's nothing like being, uh, you know, uh, sequestered to your home with children and cats and <laughs> craziness, right? Uh, to, to use it as an opportunity to uh, to improve, improve your situation at work, improve what you're focused on, what you're working on, your physical health, your mental health. Uh, I think it's been a real eye opener for, I know it has been for me, I know it has been for everybody else as well, to kind of look at uh, look at the bright side of things and figure out how we can come out of this better than ever. You're going to give it back to me now, Jonathan? Rob, I'm giving it right back to you. <laughs> That's awesome. I got to be honest, we have done, I don't know, a month's uh, worth of these webinars and they've all been COVID related. And, you know, I've heard all these companies talk about their shifts and their pivots that they've done. This actually has been my favorite, been much more conversational. I've learned quite a bit. Probably the most important thing that I learned was Nicole has a 500 ton mail machine in her business, which I got to be honest, as a as a person coming from a, a print and mailing background, that's impressive. I, I don't know that I've seen a 500 ton machine before, so uh, I do need pictures of that. Um, listen, uh, you know, Sean, Nicole, Neil, Jonathan, uh, this was an absolute pleasure to sit back and watch. I love hosting these things because I learned so much, and I just like hearing the optimism and the uptick of what's going on out there. It's been it's been really inspiring as anybody can attest to sitting back at home in a very you know uh, unique situation to hear these stories and to hear how people have gotten through this and how they're dealing with things. Sean, you as a company that's had to also shut down, like so incredible to watch you know how you're 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 pivoting on that, and so. You know, this has been exciting for me. Um, I, I do thank you guys uh, uh, quite a lot for, for spending your time with me on this. Next week, I want to bring up that we have, and I'm going to try to read without messing this up because it is a tongue twister. Crisis comes, uh, oh, from crisis, I, I knew I'd mess up. From crisis comes opportunity, higher ed during and after COVID-19. I don't make these things up, I just report them. Uh, this is gonna be moderated by our friends over at DMS. Um, we've had a lot of, of requests for us to deep dive into a vertical, and so this is gonna be one of our first uh, in this series. We'll get into lending and some of the other verticals, insurance and home services as we move along, but this is gonna be our first dip in the EDU. So it's gonna be exciting to learn what they have done from data and to learn how they have pivoted in the, in the for-profit space. And, and I think you're gonna find some very interesting results, whether you're in the EDU space or not, on what's going on with the consumer and the mindset out there. It's, it's mind baffling as we went through some of the, the uh, practice sessions. Once again, you can find any of this on leadscouncil.org's resource hub tab. And, and once again, Sean, Nicole, Neil, Jonathan, I got to remember all these. Thank you very much for your time and look forward to this. I'll have this thing up probably Sunday uh, edited down. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Appreciate it. A lot of fun. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.